Yeah. All right. Yeah, I was born like Hi, that. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hi. So I'm excited to be here today. Uh, first, we need to thank DXB for inviting us out. Uh, welcome, Kirby. Say hi, Kirby. Hi. <laughs> Kirby um, is from Pierre Moss. He launched it in uh, 2013. Yeah. Uh, he spent the last five years challenging and redefining the role in menswear and now womenswear, correct? That is correct. All right, good. So with no more accolades, we're going to introduce Kirby Ray Raymond. Yeah. So hi everybody, my name is Kirby Jean Raymond. Um, thank you for coming out. I love like I love this small crowd. If you guys, you guys wouldn't want mind, to move down, if come you wouldn't down. mind, come in uh, a little bit, because uh, the more the more intimate it feels, probably the more revealing I'll get. So exactly. Let's uh, <laughs> let's let's bring it in towards the front. I like I like the smaller I like the smaller environment anyway. Um, so yeah, so as Sharifa says, my name is. My name is Kirby Jean Raymond. Um, I am the founder and creative director of Pierre Moss. And um, Pierre Moss is a brand that I started five years ago, just a little over five years ago. And um, we are here because we have a partnership with Reebok and um, uh, Reebok is nice enough to set us up with this right here. So okay. I'll be available today for all your questions. and. Um, you know, real talk, I guess. And oh, and Sharif is actually a really good friend of mine. We actually, yes. she's nervous, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> and Sharifa, Sharifa is actually like a real, real friend. Like we, we spent New Year's together. Yes. So I was actually shocked when I saw her name on this. <laughs> and I was like, what? I was like, I was like this is going to be, this is going to be interesting because like we, yeah. we, she knows everything about me. So it's yeah. going to be a, it's going to be an interesting, uh, interesting conversation to have. So, so try not to read from the cue card too I'm going to read from my cue card just so I stay on point. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, let's start from here, from Brooklyn to Dubai. How we mm -hmm. feel? Uh, jet lag, <laughs> first and foremost. Yeah, this is it's a crazy. First of all, they lied to me about Emirates, and they told me that there were going to be showers on the plane, and like, uh, yeah, yeah, and like you know, first of all, it was a <laughs> complete catfish. Oh no! I mean, it was just a regular. It was like it's like a regular business class. I don't think you understand what I went through, so don't even. Worry about it. <laughs> I had someone yeah. throw a whole bunch of drinks on me by mistake. Oh, wow. Just FYI oh, on shit. Emirates. So oh, damn. We'll be yeah. speaking to Emirates. Yeah, so yeah, the Emirates is not what, uh, <laughs> what I expected. But, yeah. uh, but, I, but I hear there's a, I hear there's like a first, first class. Yeah. That I wasn't privy to. Ah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, maybe. We Apparently there's a third floor. They might, they uh, <laughs> might yes, be a third yes. floor. I don't know. So uh, Kirby's uh -huh. being so modest. I've watched, like he said, we's been, we've been friends for many years, and I've watched this man grind, and I'm super proud and super excited to be leading this conversation with him because if you guys even understood where he came from, you'll understand how far he is today. This, this shit is amazing. And excuse my language if I curse, because that's just how I speak. It's We're how, from Brooklyn. It's We're how from we Brooklyn. talk. <laughs> okay, so I have this personal mantra for myself, and it's called set your tone. And basically, when I say set your tone, I mean not be apologetic for anything that you do in life, and just set your life on goals. I want to ask you, what is your tone? When, you set, when I say set your tone, what does that sound like to you? Uh, I have, I'm unapologetic and I have a dark sense of uh, humor and drama that I like to incorporate in my work. I, I feel like um, what makes us so successful is that even though we are um, presenting ourselves to the world as a luxury brand, I still talk like it's just you and me. Yeah. And I talk like that through design and I talk like that when I'm talking. So uh, it's, it's kind of... Uh, the tone that I've set uh, has been unapologetic, confident, um, sometimes arrogant, mm -hmm. depends on my mood, and, uh, you know, that's it. I was, okay. uh, yeah. So when I say from Brooklyn to Dubai, can you just give the audience a little accolade of, like, who are you? Who okay. is Kirby? Well, I'm a culmination of things. I'm a culmination of my experiences, but I, my, my story started in East Flatbush, Brooklyn. My, my, I, I don't think I've ever said this publicly, but my mother went, my mother was eight months pregnant, well, sorry, nine months pregnant, and um, in Haiti, mm -hmm. and she was a very much of the mindset that I should not have been born in Haiti because she wanted me to have an American passport. Wow. So she lied at the airport and told them that she was only six months pregnant. Oh, wow. And started to have labor pains on the plane <laughs> and held it 
and my, my heart C-section had a little bit of complications, but I was born on midnight, November 1st, 1986, because, of, because my mother was insistent that I have an American passport. So um, I, that's the first time I've said that publicly, but my, my, my family uh, is all Haitian. I taught my parents how to speak English. Mm -hmm. I didn't learn how to speak English until school. And, you know, I grew up in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, which is a, you know, very cool community because it's one of those, it's one of those last places in, in New York that's still not gentrified. Yeah. And um, it says a lot about how rich that culture is. And, like, that culture is just very, um, it's just very uh, potent, mm -hmm. right? It's like Jamaicans, Grenadians, Trinis, Haitians, all these people that, <laughs> Beijians, that, like, Beijing. essentially, like, formed this melting pot and we have not left each other. So it's not, it, hasn't been a, it hasn't been much opportunity for people to kind of come in, divide and conquer that community. Mm -hmm. So that's where I grew up. And it, and it had its quirks and it has its features. It has its good, it has its good parts and it has its bad parts. I grew up around a lot of violence. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I'll say is um, my community was very self-policing. We mm -hmm. didn't call the cops. Um, you know, you got into a fight, you dealt with it. You got robbed, you dealt with it, you know. Um, and, you know, it just raised us to be a lot more tougher than, uh, our counterparts. So, you know, you're from Bessa, I'm from uh, East Flatbush, where it's like, you know, we, we're just raised to, uh, we're raised to just be a little bit more self-resilient. Yeah. And do you feel like your upbringings had basically any input in your design or in your, in, in the way you, in, the, in your thought process for how you design? Yeah. You know, um, I always say like our superpower is our story, right? So everybody in this room has like specific uh, things about them that are specific to them that nobody can take away. Nobody can take away what you ate this morning. Nobody can take away where you went to school, who you grew up around, fights you've had, people you've loved, all these different things. And if you don't um, use that in whatever, in, in whatever medium is your art, whether your art is accounting or it's painting or it's fashion design, whatever it is, if you don't use that thing, um, it kind of gets lost in the world never gets to hear you and never gets to hear your story. So, you know, we lose so much from conformity mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, people with the balls to essentially, like, uh, you know, be true and be authentic to themselves, those, those are the real special, those are the real special artists that we, that we love and cherish and we talk about for years and years to come, you know? True, true. Okay, so for the audience who doesn't know, who's Kay Upda? Kay Unger? Yep. Uh, <laughs> so I started designing when I was... On my own, I started designing when I was 10. Um, but I was only designing sneakers and footwear. I wanted to be a sneaker designer from, for as long as I can remember. And like, there was a, uh, in, in New York City, we get like these directory books that are like, they look like phone book. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're like this thick, and you flip through them, and there's all these different high schools. And the high schools, um, you, you, you choose from the high schools. They tell you, they tell you like what, the high schools have, like how many students are there and like what programs they have. So I landed on high school of fashion industries and on the, on the first program they had jewelry and accessories design. So it was, a, it was a, the accessories design covered shoemaking. Shortly after I got into school, um, a new mayor came in and, and like put all these budget cuts throughout the city and they cut my program. So the school only had two programs left and it was uh, pattern making and fashion design. So they put me into the fashion design program and I, and I can't even describe to you guys how it is to be your third week into school and you're 13 years old and you're making like little baby dresses and skirts <laughs> when you wanted to make sneakers. It was like the most boring thing in the world for me and it was just like really like, um, it, was just, it was just really, uh, I don't know, I, was just, I, was, I just became really disruptive. So um, I got into a fight my first, my first year, and my uh, my teacher, my teacher was like, uh, sent me down to the principal's office to get suspended. And uh, long story short, I talked my way out of it. And the way that I talked my way out of it is, I uh, agreed to take an internship. And I took an internship at K Unger New York. Uh -huh. And K Unger uh, hired me at, uh, after my internship. My internship was for uh, probably about a year, um, and then. At 15 years old, she gave me my first paycheck as a fashion designer. She hired me as an assistant designer. So that kind of like gave me my start in the fashion industry for real. 
And then on top of that, I was getting, I was getting real world education from my, my job slash internship, but I was also learning like the fundamentals in school. So I kind of had like a, a dual education that happened at the same time. Actually a triple education happened at the same time because while both of, both of those things were going on, I was also working at a sneaker store in Brooklyn called Ragamuffin. <laughs> so, um, okay. so I had like a retail, I was getting retail experience plus like, um, you know, work experience in a corporate environment, mm -hmm. plus I was going to school for it at the same time. So. Okay, that's so yeah. interesting. So, you know me, I'm big on mentorship, I'm big on internship, I'm big on all trying to help as many of the youth culture as possible. What do you think about that? Um, I think it's so important. I think, like, you know, there's so much bad advice out there. You know, I, I, you know some, I, I, I think all of us have gotten bad advice from really smart people. And <laughs> Um, you don't know, so you know, there's not, there's, not, there's not enough people who are willing to offer their expertise out there. Everybody here has something that they can teach someone else. And you can do it well or you can do it poorly, but you have to, we, I, I think it's important to, for, for our pupils, and I have a pupil who's, 30, who's, who's 38 years old and I have one that's 17, but it's like, it's so important to give them options to learn from different people. So I think, um, you know, what, what, I, what I would say is if, we ha if you have the ability to lend a hand, lend a voice, lend an ear mm -hmm. to someone who is, I guess, less, um, who has less access, yeah. then, then it's, our, then it's our, uh, our duty as fellow humans to do so. To give back, right? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to take a moment and I want to read through some of your career highlights. I mean, because you're being really modest on this stage today. <laughs> I want people to understand the accolades that, you know, you've accomplished. So in 2014, you were named the next big thing by Style.com and won the FGI award for rising star in menswear category. Later in 2014, you also was hired by Usher to design the wardrobe for all of his live shows, including the, so the sold out tour. Um, in 2015, you were, made, you were named in 30 by 30 by Forbes. Right? Mm -hmm. And Ebony Power 100. I was, yeah. And in 2016, you were also named as a regional finalist in the Walmart Prize, right? Yep. And in 2018, basically, you just won. Uh, WWD also referred you as a, not a designer, but a cultural force. Yeah, I think you... you, you and, yeah, okay. let, me, let me end it, and you walked away with the CFDA Fashion Fun Award. Yeah, I did. So we got to give him a clap on that one. Yeah, I did. So, mm -hmm. when... When oh, I hold on, say, hold on. Wait, we just got one last night. Oh, not last night. Like two nights ago, we uh -huh. won the Collaborator of the Year by Footwear News. It's for, Footwear uh, News. Yeah, so yeah. there it goes. <laughs> so when I say from Brooklyn to Dubai, you understand what I mean, yeah. okay? So my, my, with all that said, how do you feel today? How, when you were getting these awards and all these different things, knowing what you went through throughout all these years in fashion, how did you feel? Not only just going through shit in fashion, you know, I've had like a pretty interesting uh, life, you know, I, I try not to over sensationalize my experience, but you know, I didn't grow up with like a two family home. I didn't mm -hmm. like, I, my, my, my mom died when I was seven. My father really didn't know, uh, my father didn't really know if he wanted me. I so know. I was being passed around a lot from like family to family to family and family and kind of always coming back. But um, I was in, I, you know, because of those situations, it was like, well, it was, I, I was like forced to like focus on myself really early on and like I was forced to work early. I had like a real, I was, I had to, I was like, I was worried about things that a 13 year old should never be worried about. Mm -hmm. I was worried about money and worried about food and worried about like where I'm going to sleep and things like that, like that I shouldn't have been worried about. And like all of those things now have um, set me up from where I am in mm -hmm. fashion none of the challenges have really been challenges. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, but, but, but that's what we fight, that's what I'm fighting for now is because like, do, I, do we want the next generation of designers of color or, you know, from minority backgrounds or whatever to have to go through such extraordinary circumstances yeah. just so that they can get like where I'm at, mm -hmm. which is, you know, like, like, you know, Chris Rock had that joke where he was like, um, his, like he lives in Alpine, New Jersey, and his neighbors are Oprah, Jay Z, mm -hmm. Mary J. Blige, and like, and his next door neighbor is a dentist, is a white dentist. Mm -hmm. Like the black people had to go through so much shit to mm -hmm. get to where they are, just to be in the same block as a dentist. Yeah. So that that's what we that's what we we do, and like a lot of my work sometimes gets uh, misconstrued for what it is, but it's really just 
rewriting us and putting us back in the um, in the conversation so that we can be on an even plane. So that's 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 like what what I do and who I do it for. Got it. Okay. In the WWD article, it, when they said that basically they described you as a cultural force, what did you feel and how did you handle that responsibility? Like, how do you how do you take that responsibility as a cultural force? Well, that's funny because I didn't even know they wrote that. Oh so, yes, they did. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't. I don't read WWD. Wait, but what but, uh, comes? <laughs> I know. What comes first for you, fashion or culture? <laughs> um, culture. You know, like like I said, like again, our superpower is our voice. So, we uh, we, if, if we can't ignore that. We can't ignore the things that brought us to where we are. Like everybody sitting here in this room and was brought into this room for a specific reason. Mm -hmm. And um, the the thing that ties us together. I don't see much people in here wearing Pierre Moss except this gentleman right here who's wearing a pair of sneakers. <laughs> but like, I, the thing that ties us together is not clothes. You can buy clothes at Zara. Mm -hmm. It's the it's the story. So I think it's the the cultural force. It's the it's the it's the movement behind the brand that not only brings us together but keeps us together because trends is fleeting. You know yep. what I mean? Like, one thing's one thing's in one week. Like one one week they're putting the swoosh upside down and doing mm -hmm. all these different things and you're into it one day and you're not but like I think the the heart value is the thing that's going to keep us together so that's that's why culture is always first for me okay when we speak culture because I'm a big advocate like growing up in Brooklyn I remember going to work you wanted to put shoes on you felt like as an African-American person you had to put shoes on and not wear sneakers now the whole game is switched you can go to work with sneakers and they can be dirty as hell and nobody gives a shit right, right. So my question is, when it comes to culture, is it more of a cultural awareness or a cult cultural appropriation? Hmm. So I, you know, I, I like this topic because um, I, feel like, I feel like it's important in 2018 to really define the difference between what cultural appropriation and cultural celebration is. Yes. Cultural appropriation and cultural celebration is the conversation between uh, diverse, it's like, it's like the difference between diversity and inclusion. Um, I think I think for the most part we understand what it is, but if I if, if I had to clearly define it, I would say it's like this, right? Diversity, for example, is putting black people on the runway. Mm -hmm. Inclusion is having black people put black people on the runway. Mm. Yes. You see what okay. I'm saying? So it's having people behind the scenes who actually make those decisions. Um, what we're seeing now, we're seeing like a lot of confusion of it, right? Because some of our favorite brands, I'll give you a brand, like one of my brands that I, that I like to wear sometimes is Supreme, right? Mm -hmm. Supreme is owned by the same investment group that, that, that uh, invests in planes that bombs Yemen. Okay. Right? Wow, did anybody know that? Did we all know this? Okay. Right? So, so then you also have like, I'll say this from, from personal experience, there's a, there's a big footwear company, a lot of people in here wearing this big footwear company right now, mm -hmm. um, who's invested in the Keystone Pipeline and, like, and, and, are, pers and are directly responsible for uh, the poisoning of the water in Standing Rock, yeah. right? So like, there's, there's so much, that, and, then, and then you have, you turn around, like these same companies who are like invested in like all these things that are like detrimental to the environment, detrimental to growth, or detrimental to, or like, or like causing wars overseas and things like that, they'll turn around and put your favorite athlete on a poster, like Ka Colin Kaepernick, for example. Yeah. Turn around, put Colin Kaepernick on a poster, and Colin Kaepernick's now the poster boy. Oh, they, they can't, this company can do no wrong. Yeah. But it's, that's the difference between um, diversity and inclusion, really, because that's like, not having sane people or people who give a shit behind the scenes. You have people who are just showing you, we're showing you, look, look how, look how, look how forward thinking we are. But behind the scenes, we're like poisoning your communities. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like the other day, like I was offered, every day I'm being offered deals now, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants some of the sauce. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was offered, but you know, Nate, who's in this room, my publicist, we turn down shit every day. We turned down McDonald's the other day. Oh, thank like, God. You're, you're, thank you. You're not about to turn around and, like, give my whole community diabetes and the gout, and you want me to, like, fuck around and, like, make a, make a uh, capsule thank collection you. for you. So it's just, it's, 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 having more, it's having more of this behind the scenes, right? Mm -hmm. but, if you, but if you do this, here's, here's the thing, right? Here's the catch-22. Imagine, imagine you got four of me's in your boardroom. 
Yes. Nothing's going to get done because you're like, oh, shit. Like, we want to put this. And I'm like, no, you, yeah. you got to stop the oil well first. You got to, you know what I mean? So, so it's, it's, it's a, what we're seeing right now is like, we're seeing a lot of companies um, who are showing you boldness but, all, but at the same time, they're showing you boldness by like, by like show, they're showing you representation, mm -hmm. but they're not showing you boldness in change and, and action and any of, that other, other, any of that other stuff. They're just showing you, um, they're showing you like, hey, we still want your money. Yeah. Can we, let's, let's shut you up right now. Just keep, keep giving us some money. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? That, that's, that's what it really, that's what it really boils down to. It's not, you're not getting, you're not getting much out of them behind the scenes. So. Um, you know, I could talk about that shit for, for, for days, but, Got you know, if, but, but I will say this, if I could give you some brands, but if Pierre Moss is too expensive or Pierre Moss is not your cup of tea, there are some brands that are really doing the work behind the scenes. Um, Noah, mm -hmm. who's owned by um, Brendan Babazian, yeah. um, he, he's really about he's that really shit. He's really about it, yeah. Uh, Brother Vailey's, uh, who's owned by my good friend Aurora, she's like out in communities in in Africa and Haiti and stuff mm -hmm. like that. She has artisans and merchants who are like making things in a sustainable fashion. Yep. You have brands like Chromat. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a positive, the great thing now is that we have options. There's a positive um, alternative yeah. to every, for, to all the bullshit you used to buy. And the great thing about it too is the alternatives most of the time look better. Yeah. Agreed. So, so um, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not devoid of options now. I just think the consumer has to stop being so lazy. I also think that the consumer needs to be aware. Yeah. I think that the consumer nowadays is not, no longer aware and they're being shoved so much product. Every day it's something new, right? And they're, when you're on Instagram and all these different social media platforms, the consumer is getting shoved so much product down their throat, they're not aware of what they're buying. Right. So no longer is there value, it's just a bunch of stuff. And right. I think that that's a big problem happening right now. I'm going to switch the conversation to collaboration. So congrats on your Reebok collaboration. Thank you. You know, you're doing big things. How did this collaboration come about? Uh, so I was, about to do, I was about to do a deal with the devil. And <laughs> um, I needed the money at the time. You know, the Pierre Moss, like, so last year we... Um, Last year we went through a lot of like legal shit, and I was mm -hmm. and I lost my company for a minute. Yeah. Uh, you know we went through we went through a phase where we were pretty much out of business, and I got offered a, a collaboration deal with another brand, and um, somebody at Reebok got hold that that got word mm -hmm. that this was about to go down, and they offered me essentially more money and creative control. And, but I had to, but the caveat was that I had to wait a long time. Mm -hmm. So I waited about 10 months. So you imagine like you're broke as hell, but like, and, and you have uh, essentially guaranteed money right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And somebody's telling you wait nine to 10 months to potentially get something else that could be bigger. But I know what I stand for. And I know like, um, even if it didn't happen, I knew that that was a wake up call that if I had done that, if I had done that other deal, I would have been a hypocrite because yeah. all the other things that I just talked about, you know, um, with the other company's politics mm -hmm. were, were, were clear to me and I knew them, yeah. but I was still going to do that deal because I needed the money and I needed to get out of a jam. So I was able to, um, you know, I was able to borrow, beg from friends mm -hmm. and let nine months pass by and, and finally start working on the Reebok uh, collaboration. And when we when we when it happened, it just we kind of like had to hit the ground running because we wanted to be ready for February to mm -hmm. have a to have a runway show. And um, I don't know if you know this, but if you work with a company like Reebok or like or Adidas or whatever the case is, you have a 120 day lead time for anything. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, from the time a design goes from paper to your foot or your 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 your, your shirt or whatever, it's 120 days. For me, with Pierre Moss from the time I designed something to the time the sample's ready can be as little as three days. Yeah. So um, we, we, got the go, we got the go ahead with the collaboration in late September mm -hmm. and we had to have everything ready for February. So we went straight to Shanghai mm -hmm. and we just banged everything out. And we probably made like the stuff that you guys ended up seeing. Yeah. It's probably like quadruple that amount. I just kind of over-designed. And, and at that point, I had like missed the season. So I had all of this, like all of these ideas. So I just gave them everything. Mm -hmm. First thing I designed was a do-rag and a fur coat. Yeah. Um, 
I was trying to be funny. Mm -hmm. I, and they were like, well, I guess we have to make it. I was like, whoa. I was like, yo, I was like, wait, so I really have creative control? Because, uh -huh. you know, they gave me creative control and they put it in the contract. And I, I was like, let me see, let me, let me test the waters real quick. So I made this floor length do-rag and, <laughs> and I made a fur coat that said Reebok up the back. Oh, yeah. And, um, and I was like, and I gave it to them and I was like, all right, well, they came back with tech specs for the stuff. And I was like, holy shit. I was like, whoa, they are serious about this. You know, uh, Reebok is a billion-dollar boutique company. Yes. They, they don't operate like a normal corporation. Mm -hmm. um, like, I text the CEO on a daily basis. Like, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not a, it's not a, it's, it's a big little brand. Uh -huh. And they operate in a way that is so unique to this industry that it's like the most fun that I could have um, uh, working with any brand. And also, you know, like, since the success of our collaboration with Reebok, all of the other brands have now, you know, come back. Come back. And, like, they're like, you know, you want this, you want But I, I don't think I'd ever have that much fun working with anybody else. Like, I literally can do whatever the hell I want. I mean, I'm so happy which you is the, chose Reebok. Which is the craziest thing ever. I am you know? happy. I grew up on the 5411, so you yeah, know. Yeah. We're happy about that. Yeah. Reebok has a rich archive, too. Like, their archive room I remember the first time we went, walked into the archive room, first thing they do is they make you put on white gloves. So you're, so you're in there looking like Mickey Mouse, and you're, like, <laughs> picking through, like, all of these, like, uh, these, like, old samples and, you know, things from, like, the 60s and 70s and yeah. stuff like that. Shit is breaking apart in your hands. And I was like, there's so much here for me to work with that, like, I walked out of there so inspired that, like, I just I was designing so fast because I was getting so many ideas, and now I'm in collection three, and I'm like shit, I ran out of ideas. But uh, <laughs> you know I shouldn't have given everything for collection one and two. But you know we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll come we'll come up with stuff. All yeah. right. <laughs> um, when when what would you suggest like when brands are doing collaborations? How do you c continue with your identity and still have the brand in mind? Yeah. You see, so like. When I was talking to the other brands, one of the things that they did, they had like, they essentially had like prepackaged things for you already. Like, um, one brand that I talked to had like an equality campaign coming out. And they were like, you know, you talk about social justice, so we're going to put you here in this equality campaign, and here's the package, and go, yeah. you know? Be equal, mm. you know? <laughs> so it was like, that was, that was, their, that was their, their thing. And uh, what they lose is they lose they lose the ability to what, what, they, what they got us for in the first place, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. when, you, when you do collaborations as a big brand, you should want to be more like the little brand instead of the, the, yes. the, the, the little brand being more like you. Yeah. You don't want to go in there and mess up. You want, to, you want to take their culture because what happens is like you're up in Portland, you're up in Boston, you're up in Germany, or you're up in New Hampshire, and you're like mm -hmm. working on, you know, you're, you're away from, you're up in a corporate office and you're away from these things. You're pulsing the culture, easy collaboration. So if you're like essentially ig ignoring their advice when they come in mm -hmm. because you think you know it all because you've been doing it for 30 years and because you, you're, you're, you're on the New York Stock Exchange, you're yeah. completely losing the essence of what collaboration is in the first place. I think companies, when they first find the small person to do the business, they're like, yeah, this person is going to change it. But then they can't wait. Right. And that, there's always a process with these collaborations. There's always a process with these companies. Um, I know whenever I sell, I've sold like a couple trade shows at this point now. And they want you because you're cool. And then once they get you, they want you now to be big. And it's like, dude, you don't real, that's not how this works. Right, you got to exactly. stay cool. Exactly. Um, with that all said, the question is, where do you see the fashion industry going in the next five years? And what role in the world does this... Ooh, this is it's, loaded, it's, man. It's I need a to, loaded like, question. I'm, I'm too Very... hot for this one. But <laughs> hold on. I, I, have, I have a, you know, I have a, I have a lot of, I have a lot of thoughts about this. And, um, you know, I, and I definitely, uh, one, I think role of retail is changing, right? Oh I think from, so I don't know if you know, you guys know this about Sharifa. Sharifa owns a trade show called Liberty. And, um, yeah. You know, they kind of like put the pulse on trade shows, and now even she knows like now landscape. the business is changing, and the the landscape yep. is changing into more of, of stuff w of what this is, right? Yep. Um, retail is changing in that aspect too. It's more. It's all about direct interface. Yep. So what I see what I see retail stores becoming is more retail plays than actual sales plays, right? So you you're gonna see a lot of stores talking to brands about renting space in their space. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be the best thing that a brand can do because there's no there's nothing like there's there's no worse investment than spending all of your money to do a runway show, to do a 
um, to do lookbooks and all that stuff to, to sell to fickle stores mm -hmm. and buyers and things like that. It's, it's the worst business. It's the worst business model. So right now, what you're going to see is um, brands who are really focused and really have like a strong point of view, yep. talking directly to their consumer and beefing up their e-com and like their retail presence is going to be more and more um, uh, specific and focused to that brand mm -hmm. than it is going to be you you sending you sending uh, seven pieces into Barney's and then they put them however you want. Yes. You're gonna you're gonna be able to um, directly create your own spaces within these spaces. Yeah. And and Barney's if Barney's is not looking at their business right now as just valuable real estate, they're gonna be gone very soon. I mean, a lot of stores are having issues. I mean, in the states, I went to the stores over here, which was of course the first thing I did. Yeah. Uh, went to the mall. And it was interesting. The mall like, here is crazy. The mall here is retarded. The if mall you guys here live here, crazy. I would be totally broke because that's where I would live, yeah. and I think I would get a job there part time just to continue yeah. my habits. But um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> seriously, but what I realized in the states is is that you know we've lost some sort of connection to the consumer. Like right. when you go to the stores in the U.S., I'll tell you right now, don't don't think anyone's talking to you. Don't think anyone wants to help you. That's just what's going on. Right. I'm going to be honest. Right. And I think that that has played a big part in this retail industry. Like consumers want to feel like they are special. Yeah. When I go in a store, you can get me to buy anything. If you're like, oh, it looks so good on you, you yeah. know? That's what they were doing over here at the small in Dubai, and I like wanted to Man, buy everything. The, the, the guy put on the white gloves, That's and it. I was like, "Oh, you know, I love them white gloves." Right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he almost got me to buy a forty thousand dollar watch. That's I don't the even thing. have that money. <laughs> you understand? I was like, I was ready to go to checkout. Oh yeah. Like yeah. you know what I mean? Like it was that crazy. So. so with all of that said, I can tell you that if any of you guys have not yet, you should look at um, some of Kirby's fashion shows. Kirby has done the most elevated, thought out fashion shows that I've ever seen and it's just so interesting because the last fashion show he did which was Bananas, he bought the whole entire fashion industry and if you understand how New York is done everyone loves to be in New York New York Cur City. New York City. So Manhattan, a.k.a. Manhattan. Exactly. Everybody likes to be in Manhattan. Kirby bought the entire fashion industry, not only to Brooklyn, but like... To the Brownsville. Brownsville, which is the hood of Brooklyn. No, in the middle in of the, the project. In the middle of the project <laughs> for the fashion show. And it was pouring rain and people were sitting out there stacked with their umbrellas, like in hand. And you guys have to see this online if you can. Google it, find it. My question to you is, how do you still stay relevant in the, in, when, when you think about your shows and you think about anything that you're doing, what is like your, like in the current fashion climate, what's your thought process? Like, is it, I want to, I want to fuck these people up and I want them to think different or is it, I want to invite them to my world? So I'm going to say two things. One is if you follow trend, you're predictable. Mm hmm if you're a trendy person, I know what you're going to do next. Yeah. But if you're, if you're authentic and you're, and you're drawing from your own story, mm -hmm. I have no idea, unless I know you that intimately, I have no idea what you're going to do next. And that's the thing is I'm drawing from my own personal story so nobody knows what I'm going to do next. And, and uh, only, thing I can, only thing I can talk about is my personal experience. I mean, people are trying to steal the sauce. Everybody thinks that there's some kind of formula to it. You know, Alexander Wang just put a black choir on his show. I saw, and that he had the, I'm going to say this. He did have a black choir first. I'm going to say this. Oh, and it was man. amazing. Epic. They no, were I've, been do, I've been doing the choirs for like, He's been doing it's it. my own choir too. So we've been doing the choir. <laughs> we've been doing the choir. Like I've put together my own choir in 2015 or 16. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing a choir for every single show. And like, you know, now that we're winning all these awards, people are like, what is that? What are, what are those elements? Like, wh how can we replicate the success of Pierre Moss right now? So they're like, it must be the choir. Let's put the choir in. So it, it must be black models. Let's put black models in our show. Mm -hmm. It must be, it must be um, him having like rappers in, our, in his, uh, in, on the runways. Let's put rappers on the runway. But you just don't have the sauce. Yes. You know, and if you don't have the sauce, you're, yes. lo you're lost. You know yes. what I'm saying? So like, yes. you got all of them like just essentially, you got all of them trying to take remnants of it, but it's not authentic to them. It would, I would respect you if you took, if you drove from your own, if you own your own uh, experience. If your experience is as an Asian American male and you grew up in Tribeca or whatever the case is, and you spoke to that, I'd be like, wow, I can get behind this because you're teaching me something about you. This is why we draw the music. Yes. Because we listen to music and we listen to people's stories and like, you know, that's why we, that's why we love lyricists, right? Mm -hmm. You listen to like Nas and Nas is like breaking it down for you on a, um, 
Nas is a great storyteller, right? Yeah. You listen to sto- songs like Sekou's Story and New York State of Mind and things like that, and he's walking you through like a, a, a day in the life. Rakim mm-hmm. did the same thing. Jay-Z did the same thing. Walks you through like their personal experience. That's all we have that's unique to us. So if you take that and, you, and you're essentially trying to emulate shit that you see, you're going to look corny as hell. Mm-hmm. And, you're gonna, and you're not going to stand the test of time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so like, so it's, it's, all about, it's all about just being like, really, really true and drawn from your inspiration. If your mother yells at you every night and that's not in your story, yeah. you're doing the world an injustice. If, 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 you, if, you, like, if you have a gambling addiction mm-hmm. and you're not putting that into your personal story, you're doing the world a disservice. You're not, you're not a good director. You're not a good artist. You're not a good anything unless you're, you're, drawn, from, you're drawn from within. So my shows are just a culmination of all the ideas and all the things that I just I love and that's, that's around me. So. Okay, okay. Um, there's this famous uh, photo of you and Anna Wintour and your back is towards them. Yeah. Yeah, me and Amon planned that. We did that on purpose. I love that. Yeah, and, yeah. What, what does it, and what does it say on the back of the shirt? It says, if you, if you had just learned about Pierre Moss, we forgive you. Uh, exactly. So it was epic. My question is, within this fashion industry, do you think that there's enough diversity? So uh, <laughs> I, 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 hate to, I hate to derail every time, right? But I, but I want to make sure I give context before I say stuff. Um, I do feel like there's two, there were two fashion industries. Um, there's the fashion industry that most of the people in this room probably knew that like existed with like FUBU, Kuji, Kalkanai, mm-hmm. Cross Colors, um, Baby Fat. Baby Fat was doing big New York Fashion Week shows and they weren't listed on the New York Fashion Week calendar. Their shows were at Radio City Music Hall. Yeah. Bigger than Hilfiger, bigger than anything else. Uh, FUBU was a $500 million a year business at its prime. Like, there was this, there was this essentially like this bizarro world that was existing, like, and it was running concurrent with like the, the fashion industry. And what you're seeing now is the white establishment running out of ideas and not emerging the two. So now you, now you see like people who've been, when I say white establishment, I don't mean white people, I mean white, whiteness is a mindset, right? Yep. So you, so you, so it is. It, it, it's, it's a mindset. It's a mindset of like superiority and it's like elitism. And then there's the rest. And then there's the rest of us, right? The rest of us who believe in each other, who like champion each other, and who are allies to each other, and understand that like we can't go far without each other. And you know, there's like that. There's a, there's the two things that there's the two things that have essentially existed concurrently. But like we have now um, essentially crossed over. We're like we're, we're, we're like we haven't changed. They're just kind of like coming in. Coming in. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, just, it's just an interesting thing to see. So when you ask, is there enough diversity in the fashion space, I, mm, there's, not a, there's, there's diversity happening. Yeah. There's not enough inclusion mm-hmm. from, from my liking because I know these brands intimately and I know there's not enough people calling the shots behind the scenes who, who, who give a shit about us on a human level. Got it. Okay. Um, before, the last, last question for me is... Where do you see Kirby 2025? Um, <laughs> how old will I be? Hold on. <laughs> what day is it? How many years from now is that? 2025. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be 39, uh-huh. 38. I'll be 38. And uh, uh, if, if I make it, right? You are going to make uh, it. Because these flights have been killing me. Um, <laughs> if I make it, uh, you know, I hope to build my own version of LVMH, but that champions substan- brands of people of color and minorities and uh, that are just like substantial, mm-hmm. that, are like, that, that are like creating uh, positive change in their communities and, um, and doing it our own way. So like, as opposed to um, buying up a bunch of brands that are 100 years old and creating a portfolio of that, mm-hmm. um, investing in deserving young talent Yes. and creating and, and sharing resources with them. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's what I plan on doing in the next, what is that, six years? Six years, yeah. okay. So I want to open it up to the audience. Do you have a mic or? Uh, do you guys have any questions for Kirby? <laughs> Hi. Hey. Um, so Wait, I'm you got to give your name. This is my a name. family okay. name. Hey, hey, sorry. Hi, <laughs> my name is Roseanne. And um, I actually want to read you a quote that I think sums up a lot of what you said, um, particularly when it comes to the difference between inclusion and diversion. And then I have a question. 
So the quote is, the marvel in Monopoly knows no difference between genuine support and a thieving surveillance. Mm. Mm. So I read that yesterday, funnily enough. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah so how do we, as these merging cultures, you have the whiteness mindset and then you have everybody else, how do we ensure or how do we even tell the difference between genuine support and thieving surveillance? You know, the easiest one, right? Like, kind of like, kinda like the, the lowest hanging fruit for like this, uh, getting this knowledge is kind of like just doing research on these companies. Like, we talked about the Kaepernick thing, right? That's, that didn't sit well with me. Of because, course. Because I know what that yeah. company's invested in. I know yeah. the investment banks that they invested in, and I know, um, and I know like, that it's a band-aid mm -hmm. to essentially shut us up for right now. Right. While we keep doing our thing in, behind the scenes. Right. And, you know, uh, raping and pillaging and, and doing all those other things. Yeah. So, like, the the easiest way is to just really do your research. I, it's it's so hard for me to like understand how phones got smarter and people got dumber. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah. I think I should rephrase my question: Is how how do we get that out there? You know, like, like you said, it's a facade. We're yeah. we're currently in mode facade. I, I love what's how happening we, right now because yeah. I you know like if I, Twitter's my favorite social media platform because I love that people call out everything or sometimes it gets a little too much because it sometimes it's like yeah. you guys are just calling out the wrong shit but for the for sometimes it, yeah but sometimes it really does help because one person brings interest to one thing and it kind of like spreads like wildfire and uh really what it takes is just kind of like just one person to kind of like just blow the whistle on yeah. something and then and then people and then people now are informed you're still going to make that bad choice mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying you still you still i, I i'm not going to front like there was some supreme pants that i wanted a few months ago, I bought them. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, mean, I asked for, dis I asked yeah. for a discount. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But like, but, but I didn't want to pay the full thing, but I knew I needed those as a reference. I need right. to buy those as a reference. So um, we, 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 have to, we have to at least be consciously stupid. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? If we're choosing to be stupid, way, at least yeah. be consciously stupid. Good way, Good way to put it. I have no problem with us making stupid decisions. I just want us to know that we're making the stupid decision. Right. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Who's next? Ah. Hello, I'm Tam. I have one Hi, question. Tom. How do you get out of your creative blocks? Man, I surround myself with other creatives. That's like the easiest way. Like uh, in New York, there's like I have. I'm so lucky because I have like a little my little crew of designers. It's like me, Laquan Smith, Telfar. Um, uh, all these guys, like uh, Brother Villies, I mean Aurora from Brother Villies and, and Becca from Chromat, and I'll go to dinner with them, or you know I'll go to I'll go to dinner with them and come back with a bunch of ideas. I watch a movie, um, an independent film, and I come back with a bunch of ideas. It's you know I think uh, as creatives we just kind of like we're kind of like a, a I don't know if you guys ever had like one of those old stoves where like the flame was always lit, but sometimes you have to go put the fire on it so that you can actually get, that's, that's how we are as creatives. We're like, we're all, we always have that flame, but we just need to activate it sometimes with a little, with a little lighter. That's where the trust comes in. Right. Because here with the creatives in Dubai, when there's that circle of creatives, they just end up biting each other's creativity. Oh, that's because oh. nice. they're not drawn. That's because they're not drawn from here. You know what I mean? That yes. they think they think that they know what people are supposed to want. They think that they know what people want based off of what they've already seen. And they're too scared to do something new because they're scared of rejection. That's what it really is. And it's like once you get past that as a creative, you're, you, in the beginning you have to copy bef before you figure out who you are. Yoshi Yamamoto has a very controversial quote. He's like, copy, copy, copy until you figure it out. I hated that quote because I was like, damn, I know designers that do this and they're copying off of me. But, um, but it's a good way to get a start. Okay. We have one more question. Time for one more question. Anyone? There's a guy over there. Uh, blessings, uh, us here. Uh, just a quick question. Do you think that fashion can change perception about, um, about you know, like a, a, like a, a, a religion or, or an area, like for example, right here in, in the Arab world, do you think that fashion uh, because music is doing that, like through hip-hop, through Arabic hip-hop, it's been able to do that, for example. What do you think about fashion? Is it able to do that as well, changing perception about this part of the world? Let me ask, let me ask you a question. What is the, 
uh, do you think do you think there's a more powerful medium of art than fashion in the world, or more ubiquitous medium of art in the world? No, I do think fashion is is something uh, definitely that can do that. Music and fashion can definitely change uh, yeah. perception. Fa fashion is fashion is the only canvas that people wear and they have to wear. You know what I mean? Like, so you have a, you you have an opportunity as like a creative. I don't know if you are creative, if you're a designer or whatever. But like, you, we have an opportunity as a creative to essentially throw our art on people's backs and make them walk around and show other people that. So you know what I mean? Like, it, there's there's no there's besides music. This is the most powerful form of communication. And I just think that for the most part, people use it. Um, for tribalism and not for communication as, 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 as much. We want to make sure that, well, what I'm trying to show people and lead by example with is that we can use this to communicate. Um, you know, most of the communication is nonverbal anyway. So, like what we see, like, I, I can tell, I can, I can um, make a lot of assumptions by, uh, by what people wear, but if I know they're wearing a specific brand, like, I see this man, right? Like, can you stand up, sir? Can you just stand? I say to call you out like this, right? But if he, but if he wasn't wearing Pierre Mars sneakers, right? You, <laughs> he, right? But but like because because you know the brand and because you know what we communicate, and because now you say Yo, he's he's open minded. I'm gonna go talk. You know what I mean? And that might that might mean the same for Noah. That might mean the same for. Sorry, you can have a seat. I'm sorry. But, uh, <laughs> you, you know that might mean that might mean that for uh, a lot of brands. And like when when brands stand for certain things, right? And if you don't know what the brand stands for, you probably should stay away from that brand. But like brands stand for certain things, and when you see somebody uh, wearing something, you you know that they're they, they're communicating on that on that uh, on that uh, on that wavelength. So it's just it's just important to like for brands one to start communicating with their beliefs more openly, and that people can buy into them with um, because it, it 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 now serves as a second form of communication for them. You know what I mean? Or at least a conversation opener. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Um, Kirby, we bought. All right. Okay. Tell oh him. yeah, wait, hold on. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna go over. I don't know if you guys are gonna stay or, or go over, but we're gonna go over to the Reebok booth. Uh, I'm gonna walk whoever's there through the collection and some of the hidden innuendos on our sneakers. If you want, if you want to come check got, it out. Wait, we gotta get a picture. I'm gonna get. Um,